super excited to have Joe here from Trafecta, who's so the CEO of a very well-funded West Coast company doing very important work. Uh, I don't know if you have thoughts on West Coast valuation. We can talk about this afterwards. <laughs> and also a very prominent uh, professor of uh, computer science at Berkeley. Uh, so Joe, thanks for being here. Excited thanks. to be here. Uh, Hello. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. It's been actually a delight to listen to everybody before me because they teed up a lot of stuff that's really important to me. I think you'll see a lot of the uh, themes from the evening resonate. Um, what I wanted to do is very briefly talk about what I think is one of the most important problems in computer science and in, uh, in really in the data space, which are one and the same these days. Uh, I'm happily after many years of being different, which is how do people actually work with data? And in particular, what are the interfaces we're building for people up the stack, as, as Cliff was talking about, to actually get their hands on data and get their work done? And when you think about it, we're, we're still pretty much living in the traditional computing interface when we talk to data. You know, billions of people around the world use computers every day, but when we work with data, suddenly we're looking at that again. Uh, people are writing scripts, they're working at the console. And there is a consumer uh, product for data, it's called Microsoft Excel, but in a lot of ways it's very little different from writing programs at the console. You choose a command from a set of very many menu options, and then once you choose that command, you're prompted with a wizard, which is nothing more than a dialog box that asks you to parameterize that command, and then you issue the command, and then you move on and you do it again. So you really are writing a script when you're working with something like Microsoft Excel. It's, it's got a little bit of visual help, but in particular, this thing gets no smarter the more you use it. It has no sense of what data is in it. It's not not uh, uh, intelligence in any way. Contrast that with the interfaces we're getting used to in 21st century data. So Google's predictive search, you start typing a, qu a query, it completes the query for you automatically based on the corpus of data, based on what it knows about you, and uh, it also previews for you both the probability distribution of you know, top-ranked things you might be typing, and uh, uh, what the first highest-ranked thing would be to give you a sense of whether you're moving in the right direction and can stop early. So can we take these kinds of ideas and apply them to the much more technical problems that are barriers to working with data? And that's some of uh, sort of a, a, an analogy for the kind of work we've been doing both at Berkeley and Stanford, the research that led to this, and at Trifacta. So uh, and Cliff talked about this uh, in his talk. I, I started life as a back-end uh, database systems, distributed systems guy, have increasingly gotten interested in working with people in human-computer interaction, data visualization, and machine learning. Um, and so Jeff Hare, my co-founder, uh, who was at Stanford at the time we started the work, is well known as a data visualization guy. He's one of the people behind D3.js. And he and I and our co-founder, Sean Kandel, who is the grad student, if you like, on the project, uh, founded Trifacta a couple of years ago. And as part of Sean's thesis work, he went out, and this is a good way to do computer science that I now have all my students doing. He went out and he interviewed 35 analysts at 25 companies. And he asked them, how do you spend your time? And where are your pain points? It was the kind of thing you'd do if you were starting a business. He was doing it as part of his research. And what he found was that although the market is sort of segmented into the back ends and the analytics, um, where people reported, both technical people and business analysts, reported they spent most of their time transforming data, cleaning data, munging data, right? And this has kind of become one of those things that everybody's running around saying. He just happened to interview a bunch of people to get those numbers. Um, so if you want to fix the way that people work with data, a fine place to start is there. And roughly speaking, that is what Trifecta is doing. We're building software that fills the gap between the scalable black end platforms and the visualization and analytics that people want to do on that data. So we heard a lot today um, from a bunch of really smart people. What I thought I'd do is kind of um, show you what an interaction model could look like uh, that's quite different than maybe what we're used to by showing you the Trifecta products. I'm just going to step you through a little demo of uh, what I did one Sunday night after I put my kids to bed a few months ago, and I was looking for a fun data set to demonstrate Trifacta with, and I came across some uh, public data, City of San Francisco restaurant data that Yelp had uh, encouraged the city to release. And I thought, well, this would be an interesting data set to go pull. So Trifacta is built so that you can take raw logs of the form we saw earlier on the screen where Rachel was up um, and transform them into structured data, pull out features, and do an analysis. You can also uh, do similar things to structured data. Data comes in and it's in rows and columns. It's often not finished, right? There's often work you still need to do to that data before you can do your analytics. And so this is an example of data like that. It's a nice CSV file that comes from um, the city of San Francisco. And it's on restaurant violations, all right, which is an entertaining topic. So the Yelp guys encourage them to collect this data and publish it. And so it's a CSV file that comes from the city of San Francisco. And we're just going to create a little project in Trifecta to try to pull some goodness uh, out of this data that we can analyze. All right? So we'll pull it into the Trifecta user interface. And what you'll see at the bottom of the screen is a table. 
All right? And then you'll start to see uh, what we can do with the data using what we call predictive interaction. And it should remind you, I think, of some of what we saw with predictive search in Google. So I looked at this data. I said, oh, it's got three columns, right? It's got, uh, uh, what has it got the names of these columns? We've got business ID, date, and description, OK? And so um, first of all, let's strip off the quotes. Well, you could write a script to do that. That would be kind of annoying. Why don't I just highlight a quote? And hopefully someone will get the idea that I want to get rid of quotes. So the first suggestion it gives is replace in this column at the beginning and the end, get rid of the quotes, and replace them with nothing. The second suggestion is how about replacing the quotes in all the columns? And I like that one, so I'll take it. So very much like Google, there's a ranked list of probable things you want to do based on your interaction with the data. And uh, you can preview them and see which ones you want. So you can read this command, which is in a reasonable language, or you can just look at the uh, outputs and see what you get. All right, so we got rid of our quotes. Now, these are dates. And it's sort of annoying that they haven't been formatted in a way that we recognize as dates. I could, I suppose, write a program to extract dates out of these integers. But I could also just say, hey, you know, years end here. So let's split it there into the years and the rest of the stuff. OK? And I can uh, split up the months and the days. All right? And now, um, well, let me put it back together. To do this, um, I'll just type a really simple little command. I'm going to merge. What do we want? We want column uh, date 32, right? This one. And then we want to follow it with a slash, right? So that's month slash, let's see, column, put a comma in, this 33. And we'll follow that with a slash. And then finally, let's make sure this is looking right. Yeah, it looks right. Let's put in that last year column, OK? Which, again, I need a comma. And now we've got a nicely formatted date field. And in fact, Trifacta now recognizes it as a date and shows us, interpreting it as a date, shows us the distribution. The data looks right. OK, great. So now we've got from that weird text thing in a couple of steps, we've got to a nice, neat date format. And we can get rid of uh, the yucky stuff uh, and just stick with our date. Okay, Great. So now we've got our dates cleaned up. So I did this. That's all good. And then you, know, you start looking at the text. And I like this file because it's got unstructured data in it. But what is this unstructured data? First thing you notice is every single row almost has, has another date in it, the date corrected. For whatever reason, this is the way these forms were built. Um, this got plugged into a text field. And this is the kind of thing that drives non-programmers mad. To write a script to pull this thing out of here is actually really annoying. right? You have to write a regular expression. It's kind of a drag. The dates are right there. They're very obviously in the text. So can't we just point at them and get somebody to pull them out for us? And the answer is, sure, we can do that. So you know, we can point at one date, and we get a suggestion to extract exactly that pattern from this column. Say, well, look, this is also a date. And it says, OK, I get that. You're looking at things that look like they end in 20 and 2012. Oh, OK. Come on, uh, this is also a date. Come on, let's, let's uh, generalize a little bit more. And with a little bit of machine learning rate, right, with some training data, we're getting uh, a nice pattern here. Uh, this is probably right. The data looks like it's being pulled out right. So now we've pulled our dates out of these unstructured things. And let's call this, what is it? It's the date the violation was corrected. All right. Great. So now we've got the date that the violation was posted, the date the violation was corrected. We might want to do a Microsoft Excel style thing to derive a new value, which is the date corrected minus the date that it was posted, right? So we can do that. We get an answer back in uh, milliseconds. All right, but let's fix that real quick. Um, maybe there's a day function here, but let's just do it with arithmetic. So milliseconds, we can uh, divide by 1,000. That gives us seconds. And if we uh, put another 60 in the denominator, that gives us minutes. And another 60, that gives us hours. And there's 24 hours last time I checked in a day. And now we've converted that to the number of days uh, it took to correct the problem. OK, great. So this is the uh, number of days it took to correct. Days correct. OK, so now we got this nice data. And then I started looking at the text. I said, well, this is very interesting comments on why restaurants in San Francisco had inspections. Like, for instance, the moderate risk of vermin infestation kind of interested me. So I highlighted the word vermin when I was doing this. And lo and behold, you know, it extracted that into another column that showed me that 410 out of 4,000 odd in this sample that it first pulled from the file are, so that's what, uh, 400 or 4,000, like 10% vermin? Very interesting. Let's pull that out as a statistic, all right, rather than as a, a, a string. We'll get it as a number. And we now have an indicator for rows where the word vermin occurred. And I started looking at some of the other things. What else is in here? There's um, stuff about temperatures, right? So there's temperature, and uh, there's, I don't know, thermometer. And uh, you go down a little bit, there's hot. 
And you start looking at what Trifecta is doing up at the top, and oh, I get it. I don't maybe even know this programming language, but I see it's just building a list. So why don't I add cold and uh, cool and warm? And you know, I can quit when I, when I feel like I've kind of got the picture. Oops, better to do it without a typo, though. And uh, you know, now you've got this other indicator column of temperature words. And it's a little sloppy, right? This is pretty ad hoc, but why not? Let's give it a shot. Turn that into an indicator column. All right, now we've got the second thing that we just built, which is sort of a temperature indicator. So this is the temp field, and this is the vermin field. And now we can ask questions like, per business, you know, um, tell me the sum of the vermin column. So how many vermin violations does each business have? How many um, temp violations does each business have? And on average, how long does it take it to correct one of these things? All right. And now that's kind of interesting information. All right. Suddenly we took this file that looked like it really didn't have very much data in it. And we massaged it, manipulated it. We pulled out some interesting data about the file. Um, this clearly worked out wrong um, because I averaged the mean date, not the mean number of days. So let's go back and let's, uh, let's fix this. All right. So we'll go in here and we'll change that to days correct and add that to our script, and that should look better, assuming this all works out. And uh, I might have to go and reload the page. Sometimes we get a little fussiness on undo with our interface here, but we can always do that. Oh, maybe I typed something wrong. Some mean days, there's too many. It was behaving correctly. I didn't have faith. There we go. OK. And we can see, actually, that there's some uh, data that came out funny here. Um, there's mismatched values here. So let's look at what those mismatched values were that didn't work out correctly. Not a number. Aha. There were certain things that didn't have a date corrected, if you remember. And so when we tried to divide null by something, we got a nan. And so let's go back, and let's just turn those things into, um, I don't know. We can turn them into zeros, maybe. There's a suggestion to turn them into zeros here. We could turn them into 365. Let's turn them into zeros. OK, so now we have this nice data. We might want to know, uh, well, what are these businesses and which are the most verminous ones? So we can highlight the very verminous businesses. And we can do things like look for correlations. Maybe I'll do this many. All right. And you can see, you know, at least as a hypothesis, that verminous businesses seem to be correlated with, maybe, with relatively low days to correct the problem, which is somewhat comforting for us in San Francisco. <laughs> um, and you know, maybe we don't want to limit this to eight in case our sample of the data doesn't have everything. So we'll highlight, and in fact, we'll only keep the rows that are very verminous. Um, sum of vermin greater than, I want the sum of vermin to be greater than five, let's say. So we can edit these things. Um, and we'll add that to our script. And at this point, we might be curious, you know, well, what are these restaurants after all? And so you know, we'll join it with the data that also came from Yelp on San Francisco businesses. Uh, we can join you know, business ID here with business ID there, and then we can pull out, say, all of our statistics as well as the name of the business, all right, and uh, the address of the business perhaps as well. And you know, my friends, if you come to the city of San Francisco, these are some places you might consider uh, twice uh, whether you want to run these, <laughs> all right, whether you want to go to these businesses. So this is just an example. You know, I want to highlight a couple of things. First of all, it should be this easy to work with data. It traditionally hasn't been. I don't been. And part of it's because it's not actually easy to do this. You have to think about the interaction model. You have to think about um, the data and the query processing. And you have to think about some machine learning as well. And I'll give you a little example of how this fits together. This language up top here is a domain-specific language we designed called Wrangle. Okay? And it's got verbs in it that are appropriate to the task of transforming data. The interactions we have are not the language. We don't have you type the language at all. We have you highlight features that are visual. You can highlight bars. You can highlight text. From those features, we then infer a probability distribution over sentences in the language. So ask yourself, if you had a language like Java, what would you be able to infer when I highlight you know, a bunch of numerals about what you might do next in Java? Ooh, I see you've highlighted a lot of integers. Perhaps you'd like to start a for loop. Right? It's just the wrong semantic level of reasoning to be able to think about automatic programming. But if you have the right semantic level of automatic programming, you have a smaller search space to search for utterances in the language. All right? And then you have to have previews. Each one of these statements has to have a meaningful preview so the user can say right or wrong whether the outcomes make sense. So the visualizations as well, they're not fancy data visualizations to echo some of the comments earlier. They're very simple. They're just enough to get your eyeballs on the data and get a sense whether things are going right. So there's a lot of subtlety around the interaction model, around the technology 
technology and around understanding how you work with data. And that comes together, that's what we call the data trifecta, if you will, hence the name of the company. Uh, the last thing I'll, I'll just point out is that once you have things in a nice high level language, look at all this code we wrote. All right, I can translate that. I can translate that into a script that can run in Hadoop on a full uh, terabytes, petabytes of restaurant violations, uh, or web logs, or what have you. Uh, or I can, run, I can translate it to JavaScript, in this case, and run it on the desktop as well in Node. So this is the ability to have this in the right uh, intermediation language allows you, as, uh, as we were hearing about earlier, to partner with platform providers. We could translate this to SQL. We could translate this to streaming queries, and so on. Right. So this gives you a sense of some of the things that I think can be done with interfaces when you sort of think about how can computers help us interact with data, and then how can we uh, take that interaction and the data and, and really scale it up to big problems. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, time for a couple of questions. You want to yeah, sit sure. down? If any, uh, just right before the drinks. <laughs> There. Lemon Company, please. Uh, James Beveridge from DMB. Um, this is awesome. This is very whiz bang. Um, can you talk a little bit about the uh, natural language processing, um, I guess, tools? I, a, a lot of the searching you demonstrated was somewhat anecdotal in terms of looking at what you can see above the fold. Um, are there uh, ways, I guess, to use the platform to do some of that searching automatically? Let's see, um, one thing I'd emphasize is there's, there's no real natural language processing going on at all in this tool. And in fact, as I sort of alluded at the beginning, we don't view ourselves as an analytics platform doing advanced analytics at all. So everything we do under the covers with machine learning is, is to the end of making data transformation and data cleaning easier. So for instance, when you saw me pulling out uh, keywords out of those comments, there was nothing, uh, there was no, no semantics in that. We weren't trying to figure out if Apple meant a computer company or a fruit. Uh, those are things I've done in my research, um, but they aren't a focus, I would say, for, for the product we're building. Um, so that's one thing I'd highlight. Um, uh, in terms of how do we translate from those features to a ranked list of statements in the uh, language, there's a, there's a bunch of different things we're inferring under the covers, like what data types do we see, how many anomalies do we see, uh, how would these transformations affect the outcomes of the next step, and scoring that as well. So th there's a bunch of things around the interaction and the data, as well as the history of the use with the tool. One last question. Uh, I'm from Virtusa. Uh, your tool uh, with unstructured data, uh, building the context and trying to get the data out before any analytics happens on it, uh, and also uh, profiling the data before you start doing anything. So it looks like you're trying to do both of it, but where do you see the future of these two going? Because a lot of unstructured data has a lot of business value. And people talk about more about repetitive data that comes in, but there's a lot of non-repetitive data which is unstructured, which could probably use this technology. Let's see. So there's data that, that sort of longs to be structured, if you will. Like there's data that it, it may not be in a clean form right now, but really what's going on under there is there's repeated patterns of information that, that you want to pull out as features in structured data. Um, and I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity like that, and very much the um, Philosophy, I think, of schema on use for log files and other things like that have that flavor. Um, and then there's prose. There's pure unstructured data. There's, there's the kind of stuff that really you have to do natural language processing on. Um, and there, the way that stuff works is you typically extract features, which are themselves actually structured, and then you build algorithms over those features, models over those features to, uh, to make decisions about how you want to interpret things. Um, the former, which is to say data that longs to be structured, I think is something we can really crack the code on and make a big difference. The latter, natural language processing, we're already doing good things as a community um, there, but I think the, the bar is always set higher no matter what you do, there's more to be done. Um, so I think uh, I, I, there's some exciting presentations today about um, data and text. There's, there's so much creativity be, to be applied there, but also I'd say we're at the very beginning of a, of a very long road to turning free text and prose into data we can really trust. It's a long, long road to go. Okay, wonderful. Well, that was super impressive and very interesting. Thank you for being here. Um,